Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Today we are going to begin one of the great tales in the history of piracy. If I'm being honest, it's a bit daunting. Happily, there are some sources that were either recently released or that I just recently acquired that will help us out here, but there's still a formidable task before us. I struggled even with where to begin this story. There are so many possibilities. We could begin at the Royal Academy in London, among such illustrious names as Sir Isaac Newton. Or we could peer through the bars at the Jamestown Prison circa 1688. We could visit the court of King William III, or we could visit the governor's mansion in New York City. Perhaps the best place to begin would be the trading house of one of the most prominent names in American commercial history. Or maybe the island of Madagascar. They're all viable options. They're all places that we will be seeing in this story. But not today. That story is too big for today. I suppose we should start then... At the beginning, one of those newly released sources I mentioned takes this story all the way back to the Nile Delta, circa 1179 BCE, the invasion of the Sea Peoples. Now, we're not going to go that far back, but instead we're going to look at the West Country of England, circa 1650, where we will discuss a family named Avery. This is episode 178, Bread to the sea. Before we depart, though, I do want to take a moment to talk about sources. They're significant to this story and the search for historic fact. There isn't a lot of that to be found here. If I were to relate the facts as we know them to be true, this story could end in mere minutes. Now, I'm going to distinguish between the facts and the superstitions and the legend here as best as I can, But the legend is important. Our main character today will become one of the most famous pirates of all time. Today, in modern cultural imagination, he may be overshadowed by Sam Bellamy or Blackbeard, but for centuries this pirate reigned supreme. In fact, right as Sam Bellamy and Ed Teach were beginning to become aware of the world around them, this pirate suddenly became the most talked about name in perhaps the whole world. And this pirate was born in a little hamlet just down the road from the birthplaces of both Blackbeard and Black Sam Bellamy. His wife still lived just down the road. It's possible that as young boys they could have met her. It's also possible, although very unlikely, that as teenagers they may have seen a play about this pirate. His name loomed over the world for their entire lives. It's not overstating it to say that at the time, and for many, many years after, he was seen as the most infamous pirate in the world. Until, relatively recently, the only pirates who could come close to matching that amount of notoriety were maybe Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So we need to discuss the sources. Sources that played a role in creating this legendary scourge of the Seven Seas. For example, we don't know when this pirate died. Some of the earliest sources about him might have been published when he was still roaming the earth. At least one, the Life and Adventures of Captain John Avery, was likely published in his lifetime. 1709 was the first pressing. Three years later, that play I mentioned, called The Successful Pirate by Charles Johnson, played for four nights in London. It was a farce, and it was a flop, but some of the theatrical invention found therein did make its way into later accounts. Now that playwright, Charles Johnson, should not be confused with Captain Charles Johnson, author of A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, published originally in 1724. However, a general history does begin with the life of Captain Avery. As we've mentioned here before, we don't know who Captain Johnson was. It was probably a pseudonym, but it was assumed for many years to have been Daniel Defoe. Modern literary analysis tells us this probably wasn't the case, 
but Defoe was much more likely behind the next and most infamous source that we have. This was published as an autobiography. It was a pair of letters from the pirate himself intended to discredit any other works that were out there and to set the record straight. This was, however, entirely a falsehood. Today, this work is called The King of the Pirates, published in 1711. Usually attributed to Daniel Defoe, it's, it's a novella. I mean, this pirate that we're discussing could read and write, but I'd like you to imagine a West Country seafarer from the late 17th century using this kind of language. The King of the Pirates reads, quote, In the present account I have taken no notice of my birth, infancy, youth, or any of that part which, as it was the most useless part of years to myself, so it is the most useless to any one that shall read this work to know, being altogether barren of anything remarkable. End quote. But imagine that in the voice of, you know, Hagrid or Long John Silver. Yar, shiver me timbers! In the present account I have taken no notice of my birth. You're a wizard, Harry. It just doesn't add up. So while we will reference the King of the Pirates and discuss some of what it has to say here today, it's not to be trusted. Sadly, a source that is usually trustworthy, one of our greatest sources on this entire era in piracy, is completely silent on this pirate. Even though the author personally knew this most famous of all pirates, William Dampier never once mentions him in any account. If he had, it would clear up a lot of the myth. Now, this pirate is talked about in all of those accounts that follow the publication of Treasure Island in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Most of those, though, are just a rehash of what had already been written. But then we get to the modern histories. Books by authors that have done their due diligence. They compare the early sources to the historical records from church and state organizations to find something resembling what may have actually happened. A ton of my favorite books about the topic of piracy go into the story of Henry Avery. The Pirate's Pact by Douglas Burgess, for example. All of my books about the Pirates of the Round or William Kidd or just the golden age of piracy in general. But two works specifically about this pirate stand out. The King of Pirates by E.T. Fox is amazing. Fox is a stellar historian on the entire topic of Atlantic piracy and does a great job cutting the fat from the story of this pirate and the attempt to find fact. Then there's that new book I mentioned, published here in 2020, and it was a book I couldn't put down. Enemy of All Mankind by Stephen Johnson is a wonderful book. It's wide-ranging and large in scope and goes into more than just the biography of this pirate. I couldn't recommend it highly enough. All of these sources are going to help us attempt to tell, maybe not the tale, but a tale about the pirate in question. Now, you may have noticed that I avoided naming this pirate, except in titles that named him. See, we don't exactly know what his name was. Was it John Avery? Maybe it was Benjamin Bridgman or Long Ben. In contemporary sources, reports from naval officers and the like, they name him as Avery or Ivory or a host of other variations. He's most famously known probably because of a general history as Henry Avery. And originally I intended to use that name. The family from which he is most often believed to have come goes by Avery. But this pirate signed his name to two documents that have survived to come down to us. One was a letter to his wife, and the other one was his signature upon joining a particular ship's crew. In both cases, he uses the name Henry Avery. And with that in mind, I'm going to default to that spelling, unless it's pressing it to use one of his aliases. With all that out of the way, let's travel to the west country of England, in the county Devon. 
It's the birthplace of a ton of pirates. Sam Bellamy and Blackbeard, as we said, but dozens of lesser names. Captains and quartermasters, regular crewmen that we will meet, as well as two of the grandfathers of English piracy, Sir Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh. What they call the West Country is the southwesternmost corner of England. It commands the English entrance to the Channel, and the mouth of the Thames is found in Devon. And sure, you're going to find farmers and shepherds in Devon, but it is most famously a land of seafarers. A general history reads, and everyone has used this line, quote, He was born in the west of England, near Plymouth, in the county of Devonshire. Being bred to the sea, he served as a mate of a merchantman. End quote. Now we'll dig into that in a moment, but that line, bred to the sea, is found in almost every account of Every's life. You'll see it in writings about Drake and Teach and all of the others, but that's because it was the reality for those born in the West. More than likely, for those growing up in Devonshire, you had a choice of three occupations. Fisherman, merchant sailor, or the navy. Your father and his father probably shared those exact same options. You were very much bred to the sea. Now, we don't know when Every was born exactly. The testimony of one of his crewmen, much later in this story, will say that he was about 40 in 1695. It was difficult to tell just how old Every was because he wore a wig so often, but that tidbit places his birth somewhere in Devon around 1655. Using that as a guiding light, historians have tracked down what may have been his birth. The parish records from a little hamlet called Newton Ferrers, just southeast of Plymouth, record the birth of a baby boy to John and Anne Avery on 20th August, 1659. From that, we can extrapolate quite a bit about Avery's early life. The Civil War was over by 1659. Cromwell was in charge in England, but Newton Ferrers had been hit particularly hard by the war. The West of England was mostly royalist, but big cities like Plymouth and Exeter were parliamentarian strongholds. And you can see the obvious tactical value of the most important naval region in England. The West of England saw a lot of fighting, Devon in particular. Fully one-third of the population of the county were casualties of the Civil War. There was the conscription and a number of battles, of course, but more than anything else were those pressed into naval service who just never returned. Newton Ferrers was a small town. Around the time of Every's birth, it was home to 125 adult men, with an estimated 100 family units. We could estimate a population of, what, 500 or 600 people? I mean, imagine that 200 of your neighbors, in whatever size city you live in, were lost in less than a decade of fighting. You would feel the effect of that. And in a place like Newton Ferrers, where it was such a high percentage of the population, well, that was still hanging over their head long after the war was over. However, much more pressing in Every's youth was the threat of pirates. Not the omnipresent threat of regional rovers from Ireland or Wales or France, they were always a problem, but for a few years when Every was probably about seven or eight years old, Barbary pirates were a clear and present danger. They were something of a national crisis right about the time that Charles II was restored. Ships from Algiers and Tripoli and Saleh were spotted off the coast of Devon two or three times a week. They were searching for any unwary ships they could capture and any people they might be able to carry off to sell into slavery. This was the kind of thing that absolutely would not have been lost on a boy living in Devon. It's likely that the pirates were something of a bedtime story boogeyman for boys his age living in Devon but one that was real, one that was right out there, at sea, right now. What really makes the Barbary Pirates notable in Henry Avery's life would be his later opinions on topics like slavery and, of course, piracy. 
Now, what we know about his family is limited. We could trace the Avery clan back a few generations, but there's not much to glean off that. Instead, though, we do know a bit about John Avery. He served on board a ship in the war, but we don't exactly know which war. It could have been the Civil War or the Thirty Years' War, which is more likely, or even the First Anglo-Dutch War. Some have suggested, though, that the elder Avery served as a privateer in whichever war it happens to be. Which isn't unlikely. Securing a commission wasn't difficult, and privateering was a much better option if you owned a ship. We can say with much more confidence, though, that John Avery spent the years following the war in a lucrative business in the liquor trade. Now, we don't know exactly what his role was in that trade. For example, we don't know if, during the Anglo-Dutch War, as a West Indian privateer, he made contacts with whom he traded in the new and very rich trade in rum. But I like to imagine that that's how Avery's father made his money. They didn't get rich exactly, but the Avery family did all right. Henry was educated, in at least enough to keep accounts and to read and write which is all we can say for certain, but then there's the legend. The life and adventures of Captain John Avery, which is not trustworthy, tells us about his school years. It tells us his widowed aunt was the local schoolmistress. The author of that work, Adrian von Broek, tells us that his aunt, quote, had the satisfaction of not only seeing him outstrip those of his own years, but those that had been some years before him. But here, as if fate pointed out the grandeur and wealth which he should, unfortunately, arrive at, he gave indications of such daring and commanding genius as made some of his little schoolfellows very uneasy. End quote. We've all heard the story of Napoleon Bonaparte organizing a snowball fight in his school days. A fight that he led masterfully. It's a famous story, a harbinger of the artillery commander to come, but it's probably not true. However, at least that historical fabricator had the decency to come up with a good story. All this does is give us vague mentions of a daring and commanding genius. Now, von Broek was not alone in ascribing early inspirations to Avery's later genius, if you could call his preternatural skill and high crimes, treason, and piracy, genius. There are those who suggest that Every had an education in rhetoric and even a background in theater. It's probably not true, but we can see where stories like that might come from. Later in life, Every would be possessed of that difficult-to-define something that makes the very best pirate captains. Charisma is a big part of it. Somehow, the captains who were in possession of that same difficult-to-define-something managed to rally crews full of violent, mutinous pirates and keep command of them for years. You've got pirates like Bartholomew Sharp and Charles Vane and a hundred other pirates who died before they got famous who didn't have that. But Every also had something that we find in fictional pirates all the time usually only in the cool, good-guy, anti-hero pirates. And actually, that brings up something I want to talk about. Despite how much I'm kind of gushing about Henry Every, despite how much I love this story, and even consider Every among my favorite pirates, he was not a good guy. He was intelligent and charming and handsome and very good at his job. But a lot of people were going to suffer, horrifically, thanks to his actions. Which, of course, could be said of all pirates. There are no good guys in this story. But the pirates who capture the public imagination tend to be those with which we can morally identify. When they're punching above their weight class, you know, taking on the big empires of the world, that we can get behind. When we're capturing slave ships and freeing those enslaved on board, that we can get behind. And there are pirates like that in the story of piracy. Henry Every is not one of them. That complicated morality is part of what I really enjoy about pirates. And I think we see it at its most 
complex in this story of this pirate. However, we're going to dig into that when he commits those acts that are so unquestionable. But beyond his charisma, Henry Avery possessed a truly tactical mind. He had the ability to assess a situation and make quick decisions, and most importantly, he had the ability to say no to a prize when it was right to do so. But more than that, perhaps his greatest strength was the ability to convince a violent pirate crew that they should also abandon that prize when it was right to do so. That's a rare talent, something we only see in a handful of the best pirates. All of which is a lot of words to say that Henry Avery was educated and made a surprisingly good manager. Now it's at this point, after discussing his birth and the world into which he was born and his early life and his probable education, that most respectable historians jump forward about 25 years. That's when we catch up reliably to the story of Henry Avery. But we aren't going to do that. Instead, we're going to delve into some of those less reputable stories about Henry Avery and how they built the myth of this pirate. Today, we're going to discuss the story told to us in that purported autobiography, The King of Pirates, probably by Daniel Defoe. The author writes after... Remember, telling us not to worry about Avery's youth, quote, and remember, this is in Hagrid's voice, In order to come immediately to my story, I shall, without any circumlocutions, give you leave to tell the world that, being bred to the sea from youth, none of those romantic introductions published had any share in my adventures, or were in any way the cause of my taking the courses I have since been embarked in. End quote. That's the author telling you not to listen to any of the stories so far told about the life of Henry Avery. Good advice, including this one. According to this story, after leaving home, Avery sailed for the West Indies to serve as a privateer in the Third Anglo-Dutch War. He was, of course, just a little bit late here. The war ended almost as soon as he arrived. As was the case with so many other buccaneers... He was forced to earn a living by logwood cutting in the Bay of Campeche. Now you may remember I mentioned this way back when, when William Dampier lived this exact story. Sailed for the West Indies to make his fortune as a privateer only for the war to have ended and earn a living at the Bay of Campeche. Daniel Defoe was a big fan of William Dampier. Dampier's book, a New Voyage Around the World is what inspired Defoe to write Robinson Crusoe. If Daniel Defoe did in fact write The King of Pirates, it's probable he's doing the same thing here. Now if we chose to believe this account, it would have been possible that Dampier and Avery met here in Campeche. But even if they hadn't met in Campeche, they would have, in the narrative of The King of Pirates, met when Avery, quote, served first in some of the adventures of Captain Sharp, Captain Sawkins, and others in their bold adventures in the South Seas, where I got a very good booty. End quote. The author, whomever it might be, is just using the titles of other real histories here. It's almost like they're trying to build some kind of extended fan fiction pirate universe. The author of this account continues, quote, after several adventures in those seas, I was among that party who fought their way, sword in hand, through all the detachments of Spaniards in the journey overland, across the Isthmus of Darien to the North Sea. I, with twelve of our men, by help of a piragua, got into the Bay of Campeche. End quote. There's a lot wrong with that passage. First of all, the group of pirates that fought their way overland through detachments of Spaniards passed through Honduras and El Salvador on their way to the Mosquito Coast. Remember the cavalry units charging down the mountain and the wall of smoke from which the pirates emerged to surprise the Spanish? It was a great story, and true. But that was Ravne de Luzon and his lot later on. 
The pirates who passed through Darien on their way to the North Sea were Edward Davis and William Dampier and Lionel Wafer and that group. And they didn't fight any Spaniards because there were no Spaniards there. It was Kuna territory. Remember how Lionel Wafer hurt his leg in a river crossing and had to stay with the Kuna? No? Well, you need to remember for this story that Lionel Wafer hurt his leg and was forced to stay back with the Kuna. That will play a role here. Now, all of these inaccuracies should be more than enough to convince even the most skeptical that this story is not how it happened. However, if Henry Avery was on this voyage, even if Dampier did meet him, even if they were good friends, there was very good reason, when Dampier published his account, for him to cut any reference to Henry Avery. William Dampier was trying to get his book published in 1696, and in 1696 Henry Avery was someone with whom it was dangerous to be associated. The King of Pirates goes on to tell a tale of Avery and five of his companions marching along the shore after their stay in the Bay of Campeche. They were hiding from Spanish patrols there, and finally they stumbled across a piragua. There they waited for whoever owned the piragua and saw a group of men approaching them down the beach. Quote, when they saw us, not knowing who they were, they were just going to fire at us. I, perceiving it, held up a white flag as high as I could. Upon this they forbore firing. End quote. Those men turned out to be English. Every, according to this narrative, told them about all of their troubles and that he and his friends were prepared to give up. They were even prepared to surrender to the Spanish. They assumed that this piragua belonged to the Spanish. The Spanish, even if they were arrested, as they certainly would be, would have provided them with at the very least food and a way back to civilization. The Englishmen, though, took Henry Avery and his companions on board their ship, but Avery found out that they were nefarious characters. Quote, they took us into their boat, and afterwards carried us on board their ship. When we came there, we found they were a worse sort of wanderers than ourselves. For though we had been a kind of pirate, known and declared enemies to the Spaniards, yet it was to them only, and no other. But now we were listed in the service of the devil indeed, and like him, were at war with all mankind. However, we not only were obliged to sort with them while with them, but in a little time the novelty of the crime wore off, and we grew hardened to it, like the rest. And in this service I spent four years more. Our captain in this pirate ship was named Nichols, but we called him Captain Red Hand. A Scots sailor gave him that name when he was not the head of the crew, because he was so bloody a wretch that he scarce ever was at the taking any prize but he had a hand in some butchery or other. End quote. Now that's pure fiction, but that's the kind of fiction I can get behind. Then it gets even more ridiculous, though. After a few weeks serving with these pirates, Red Hand takes Henry Avery into his cabin and into his personal council. He declared that Avery was at heart a captain, just without a ship to call his own a state of affairs that Captain Red Hand intended to rectify. Off the coast of Cuba, Captain Red Hand and Avery met with a 40-gun Spanish galleon. Even though their little pirate ship was small, the pirates engaged her and fought a stout fight. The Spanish captain, after trading volleys for the better part of a day, cried for quarter. They took this galleon, but upon inspection she just wouldn't do. She rode too deeply in the water. She was too fat, too slow, not a good pirate ship. Instead, they took all of her guns and indigo and muskets and chests of silver and barrels of rum. None of this happened. The Spanish, when things like this actually did occur, were always up in arms about it. We have their accounts of all the piracy going on here in the 1680s, and there's no account of this ship being taken by any pirate, especially one named Red Hand. It was a fiction, as were the next few prizes they claim in this narrative. 
and that includes the crowning jewel of Everie's early career. The King of Pirates gives us a full-throttle, dashing account of how Henry Every acquired his own ship, the Fancy. It's a fine story. It's, it's a fun story. But I'm not going to share it with you because that's all it is. A story. And we know how Henry Every came into possession of the Fancy. And the reality makes a much better tale. But that story is going to have to wait. We're going to leave it there today. Last time we talked about the origins of Henry Every, perhaps the most infamous pirate of the age. And I told you that today we're going to talk about what we call the Pirates of the Round, and that's true. But who are we going to talk about today? Maybe Thomas Too or William May, George Dew or William Kidd. There are a lot of options here. But instead of all of those famous names, we're going to begin with a discussion about mercantilism and colonial law of rich and powerful merchant families and their relationship with royal authority. And a little piracy as a treat. Now, I know that that might not sound exciting. The legal and economic bases of the colonial world aren't exactly swashbuckling fun, but they are the foundation on which the pirates of the round are to be built. Because, as this story is going to show us, pirates weren't a blight on the fortune of the colonial world or even of the burgeoning British Empire. They were an integral part of it. This is episode 179, Lawlessness. I'd like to begin with a relatively minor Massachusetts court case from the 1680s. In reality, I've been looking for a good place to fit this story in, and I've had trouble finding it, so today seems like as good a time as any. This is the curious case of Samuel Shrimpton. The Shrimpton family were relatively prosperous New England landowners. They didn't have the kind of sprawling plantations that you might find in Virginia or Carolina, but they owned enough land to house a few small farms that they leased out, and a couple of orchards, and even a small fishing operation. Now, I'm not going to delve into the specifics here, but when the patriarch of the Shrimpton clan died in 1684... His children disagreed over his will. Who owned what land in the wake of their father's death became a hotly contested issue. Eventually, Samuel Shrimpton and his sister went to court over the dispute. In February 1685, the court found in favor of the sister. Now, the legitimacy of that ruling is up for debate, the sister was married to a family member of the judicial body. It's all deeply corrupt, and Boston was still a small town, at least, you know, in spirit. But that's not the tactic that Samuel Shrimpton chose to use when he fought City Hall. By June of 1685, Shrimpton had still not vacated the land, and the court ordered him to appear before them. Shrimpton wrote an unbelievably bold letter to the court that told them, essentially, no. Your body is not valid, and it wasn't valid when you ruled on this case, so I will not recognize the ruling. Now, he had a point here. In June of 1684, the court of King Charles II promulgated a decree that the current colonial makeup of New England was to be abolished. They were all to be reorganized into the Dominion of New England. Word of that decision reached Boston a little later on that year on board the king's own frigate, HMS Rose, William Phipps' captain. We mentioned when we talked about Phipps that he carried Edward Randolph on board. He was the harbinger of this news. But the government of the Massachusetts Bay Colony heard Randolph's proclamation and even read the royal decree. It was all official, it was all on the up and up, but then they just kind of continued on with business as usual. They weren't ignoring the decree from the king. This was royal authority, after all. But what else were they going to do? 
The colony had to run until the new governor, Edmund Andros, arrived to set up a new government. They couldn't just take off their wigs and let lawlessness reign for the next several months. So the business of the colony of Massachusetts Bay just continued, and in that time, they ruled on the Shrimpton Will. Edmund Andros arrived in April of 1685, about two months after the court ruled on the will of Samuel Shrimpton. Now, the arrival of Edmund Andros and his reorganization of the colony threw everything into an uproar. Andros operated as almost a military dictator, almost an authoritarian. Boston was literally put under martial law. The only government body to survive more or less intact the arrival of Edmund Andros was the judiciary. They were the only body that was able to stand up to Andros and his dictatorial rule. Now this standoff was billed as a fight between the papist, monarchist, absolute rule of the Stuarts in the person of Andros and the burgeoning values of what was more and more becoming an American identity, inalienable rights, the the rule of law, that sort of thing. Of course, it's far more complex than that, and a lot less noble, and a lot more corrupt, but that's how the story was portrayed. And while these two behemoths were facing off, Samuel Shrimpton waltzed back into the story. His brother-in-law, his sister's husband, was a man named Francis Stepney. He was the dancing master there in Boston, something that apparently Boston High Society needed. But he was also the son of one of the magistrates. Stepney filed a suit against Shrimpton, in part for failing to vacate the land, but also to, quote, try his speaking blasphemous words and reviling the government, end quote. A man after mine own heart. That's in reference to the letter that Shrimpton wrote to the court there in Boston. But again, when the court ordered Shrimpton to appear, he said, No. The court had been dissolved a full eight months before the original ruling on this will, by royal decree, mind you. They have no authority to judge his claim to that land. Now, it's up for debate whether or not Samuel Shrimpton already had the backing of the Andros administration, or if he was just an obstinate farmer that hated the government. Regardless, when he offered this latest challenge, Andros saw the opportunity and jumped into the fray. He backed Samuel Shrimpton with everything he had, and that includes a lot of men with a lot of guns. When the date of the hearing arrived, a Monday, Samuel Shrimpton just stayed on the contested piece of land. He was guarded by a number of members of the Andros militia, and I presume he was busy drinking mojitos with his feet up on the porch. In normal times, the court did have armed agents who would have collected Samuel Shrimpton, but they weren't willing to do so here. That would lead to a clash with Andros's armed men, and that's a clash they certainly would have lost. A few days later, one of the magistrates there in Boston, Samuel Seawall, wrote in his journal, quote, This Monday we began palpably to die. End quote. The case of Samuel Shrimpton today is little more than a footnote of colonial legal history. But at the time, it was a seminal moment in the formation of an American legal identity. It was a negative impact. It backed royal power in the person of Edmund Andros. But it showed the Americans that their laws mattered little in the face of naked royal military power. Three years later, when a ship arrived bearing unofficial word that King James had been overthrown by William III of Holland, Edmund Andros arrested the bearer of that news on charges of libel and even sedition. It looked for a moment like Andros was going to execute him. But it was about that time that the people of Boston rose up and overthrew Edmund Andros, the man behind the Dominion of New England. Now, we've discussed the fallout from that action before, at least in Massachusetts. But the other colonies all fell into a sudden political vacuum. The governor was out. All that was left were his soldiers. So, what do we do? 
most of New England proper followed Massachusetts' lead. They set up provisional councils, mostly in the mold and in the persons of their former governments. And then they wrote to England and waited for word. What are they supposed to do here? New York, though, was different. They'd always been different, largely thanks to their Dutch origins. New York had very large populations of non-English European Protestants. Obviously, there were the Dutch, but also German and Swiss Protestants. New York was officially Anglican, but there were a ton of either Lutheran or Calvinist faithful there. Add to that a smattering of Austrian Catholics and a fairly large community of Jews of mostly Dutch origin, and you have this stew of peoples who varied in their religious beliefs. But they agreed largely on two major principles. First, nearly everyone in New York believed that those severe and austere Puritans up in Massachusetts were crazy. Second, and this is key today, they thought that the English crown's economic policies were stupid and short-sighted and bad for business. Namely, they weren't fond of mercantilism. Now I'm going to try not to get bogged down in economic theory here, but we do need to talk about this. Mercantilism was the economic theory prominent in most of Western Europe at the time that advocated for a positive trade balance. They wanted to export more goods and higher quality goods than they imported. It was an effort to accumulate as much hard coin as possible. Now that sounds obvious, right? And it is. That's the definition that you'll find in the dictionary. What really sets mercantilism apart from the feudalism that came before and the capitalism that followed is its centralization. They had a system of industrial and commercial and colonial and imperial infrastructure that was all based in the home country. Everything had to run through the hands of the monarchy or, you know, the council or whoever was in charge before it could be redistributed out to the colonies. Think about the Spanish Empire here. They owned literally all of the Western Hemisphere with a tiny sliver of Brazil excluded. They owned a sizable chunk of the richest parts of Asia as well. They extracted untold mountains of gold and silver and jewels and spices, all from their heretofore unrivaled imperial holdings. It was the grandest and greatest and richest empire that the world had ever known. But all of that physical wealth, all of that gold and silver, had to be shipped and carried overland via mule train and then shipped again on its way to Cadiz. Putting aside the ships that were lost to storm or shipwreck or pirates, think about the sheer overhead they were paying to transport all of that treasure. All of the ships that had to be built and supplied and maintained. All of the sailors who had to be paid wages. All of the accountants and bureaucrats that had to organize the treasure and then figure out where it's going to be shipped back to. It's a giant undertaking. And it's absolutely full of waste and corruption and incompetence. This greatest of all empires that the world had ever known lost time and time again in battles to a bunch of scruffy, illiterate French and English buccaneers. Time and time again, every time a pirate encounters the Spanish in this story, it's the same story. The Spanish guns were like 50 years old. The soldiers hadn't been paid in six months, and when the pirates arrived, the militia just kind of laid down their guns. I mean, what would you do there? Would you fight and die to protect a pile of gold that was only going back to Spain to enrich a bunch of fat cats? To line the pockets of a bunch of priests who told you that you were going to burn in hell if you didn't die to protect their gold? Gold that you were absolutely never going to see because, for whatever reason, you never seemed to receive a wage. Now, I'm not an economist. Hell, I can barely keep up with any discussion of modern economic theory, even when it's dumbed down for me. 
I have read a bit of Marx and Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. I do a lot better with dusty old tomes than modern theory, but Peter T. Leeson, author of The Invisible Hook, The Hidden Economics of Pirates, is an economist. Leeson points out that pirates were a an almost perfect exemplar of one of the key points in the wealth of nations. The point that self-interest is a central tenant in any healthy economic system. If you were a Spanish soldier who wasn't getting paid, why would you fight to protect some faraway king's gold from men who were really interested in getting their hands on that gold? Now, we're not going to, today, delve into a discussion of pirate economics, but it is a discussion that I am looking forward to. The point I'm trying to get at here is that the world, at least the world as controlled by Western Europe, was largely under a mercantilist system, a centralized system where self-interest was not the rule of the day. There were, of course, exceptions. Pirates are an obvious example, as are a number of merchants living in the North American English colonies. The mercantilist system in New York in 1688 was very not popular. The people, though, were of two different minds on how to handle the problem. The Dutch families, who had been living in the region since it was New Amsterdam, the old money families, they had the power to just ignore the mercantilist system. Those families, though, were drifting dangerously close to a proto-capitalist territory. This was particularly prevalent in New Amsterdam and New York, but it's something that was happening all across the Dutch Empire. They were often seen as the most advanced mercantilist nation in Europe, largely because they'd incorporated a lot of self-interested innovations. All of this made New Amsterdam one of the wealthiest cities in the Americas. But when New Amsterdam became New York, the Stuarts imposed a much more strict French style of mercantilism on the colony. However, as we mentioned, they used a light hand on the Dutch. The new immigrants, though, those that came in after the English conquest of New York, mostly British and Irish and German, they lived under the mercantilist boot. When New York was incorporated into the dominion of New England, the problems only got worse. So imagine that you are one of those new families. What do you do when the authoritarian governor, Edmund Andros, is ousted and jailed? When the king, James II, has been deposed by William III? William III, of course, being a man who was always a friend to New Amsterdam and to good business. More than likely, you do something brash. A coalition of those new immigrants, of middle-class merchants and artisans, came together to formulate a plan. They decided to follow in Massachusetts' example and oust the acting governor, the one-time lieutenant governor, under Edmund Andros. Now, I'm not going to trouble you with his name. He's not going to last long. With Andros out of the picture, his authority was null and void. Beyond that, this lieutenant governor was a coward, or at least he was in dereliction of his military duty. All of this disruption is happening alongside the early stages of what would go on to be called King William's War. The French and their Indian allies were invading and occupying the New York colony up to the north. Up in Maine, they were fighting the French, but here in New York, the lieutenant governor was too weak to do anything about these French advances. It created a perfect storm of upset colonists who wanted to do something about it. So that coalition of middle-class New Yorkers turned to one of their own, a man named Jacob Leisler. Leisler was German by birth, and trained as a military officer in a Prussian academy. He served on board a ship of the Dutch West India Company, and during his service had a number of run-ins with pirates. There were tussles with French and English buccaneers, and he had a stint in Barbary captivity, but by here in 1688 
he had settled down in New York and was a moderate landowner and a captain in the New York militia. When word of Governor Andros's arrest reached New York, that Lieutenant Governor quashed any mention of it. Messengers were arrested or silenced or even killed. But word got out nonetheless, and the plot to install Leisler was expedited. He took command of the militia. Really, he already had command of the militia, and most of the militiamen never really cared for Governor Andros. That force occupied Fort James, formerly Fort Amsterdam. That was the large military complex that occupied all of Manhattan Island south of Wall Street. This was the beginning of what would be called Leisler's Rebellion, but that's not really fair. Sure, Leisler did seize power from the lieutenant governor who was appointed by Edmund Andros, who was appointed by the king. But that king was gone, and Andros was gone. And Leisler, despite having seized power by military force, was seizing it from a military autocrat, and he acted in every way as a proper English governor. He sent messages to London to inform King William of what had happened, and he asked him for guidance, or, you know, a new governor. He wasn't standing in opposition to King William, he was trying to serve his interest here. And thanks to this new regime, business began to boom. Leisler appointed a committee that oversaw trade in the colony, and he appointed a committee of public safety. Now that has a negative connotation in the French Revolution, but this was just a police force, a fire brigade. This German-born immigrant was doing the job better than it had been done in some time. And when word arrived of a French attack on the city of Albany, the war was well underway by that point, it was 1690, Leisler led a force of the New York militia to counter it. And he did. It was a great victory over the French. But with Leisler out of the city, all of the people who stood in opposition to his governorship came forward. Now, to call these people Jacobites is probably too strong, or really not even accurate. Most of them weren't English. Nearly all of those who stood in opposition to Leisler were Dutch, and most of them belonged to those old money families. Usually a political families that were merchants of a vast wealth and huge land holdings. But inasmuch as those families did occasionally participate in politics, they almost uniformly fell into an anti-Orangist Dutch faction and with the pro-Stuart Tories in England. And it wasn't because they were all that interested in politics, except that they had done very well under Stuart leadership, and less so under William of Orange, who was now in charge again. Now those opposition leaders had last names that most of you have probably heard. Names like Stuyvesant, De Vries, Roosevelt. We're talking about American nobility of Dutch extraction of the highest order here. And I'm not going to throw all of their names at you. There's a lot of them. But there is one name that you do need to remember. Friedrich Fliepsen was a Dutch immigrant to New Amsterdam. Upon the English takeover of New York, he anglicized his name to Frederick Phillips. And he may, in fact, be the single most important person in the story of the Pirates of the Round. If he is not the most important, he is one of the two most important. Now, by this point in our story, Phillips owned a little piece of land that you also may have heard of. It's called Brooklyn. Now, okay, he didn't actually own all of Brooklyn, he just owned you know, half of it. But he also owned estates that ranged from sprawling manors to stately townhouses and places like Harlem and Yonkers and Westchester and Albany, and he had a cozy little getaway in Sleepy Hollow. In nearly all of those locations, he built churches. The most famous of these is the old Dutch church of Sleepy Hollow, thanks to the story of the Headless Horseman. 
But if you're in New York State and you come across an old Dutch church of insert township here, there's a pretty good chance this guy paid for it. I could not overstate his importance to New York history or his wealth or his land holdings. He was one of the largest merchants in New York at the time, and he was one of the key players in the opposition to Jacob Leisler. Now, he's not the main guy here, but Phillips is someone that we need to keep our eye on. I'm not going to spend much time on the military maneuvers in this little New York Civil War. None, really. Instead, I'll cut to the chase and tell you that Governor Leisler continued to act as governor from his base in Albany while those Dutch merchants held New York City. They did fight a few battles on land, all until the real English governor arrived in 1692 to arrest Leisler and to have him executed. But much more important to our story was their civil war at sea. Jacob Leisler acted in every way as a properly appointed English governor. That includes what may very well have cost him his life. Leisler granted privateering commissions to local sailors. Now that's a sensible move given the circumstances. You know, hey, we're at war with the French here, who are really nearby and they have a ton of ships. We would naturally love some naval support, but there's a war on in Europe, so privateers. On the other hand, of course, King James, shortly before the invasion of William III, issued a proclamation against piracy in the English world that really clamped down hard on the issuing of letters of mark. Of course, that was a Stuart-era policy. King William could have just waved it away, but it was William's policy to show the people of England that he was going to be a king of the English and not a king over the English, that he would enforce English laws as they stood when he came to the throne. It was a royal prerogative to grant the power to issue letters of mark, a power that had not been granted to this upstart governor. Now, we don't have records of exactly who Leisler granted commissions to, we do know of a few sharp fights they had with the French, and even of one fairly major clash they had with forces raised by those Dutch merchants. But we don't have their names. However, we could make assumptions. The incoming governor, the proper English governor, saw the need for a privateer force to guard New York City, and he had the right to grant commissions to local sailors. And those names, the names that the incoming governor would grant commissions to, are other names that you likely already know. Those are the names, in large part, who will make up the Pirates of the Round. We'll dive into that next time, though. For now, I want to leave you with a summation of this whole episode from Douglas R. Burgess Jr. in his book, The Pirate's Pack. Burgess writes, quote, The circumstances of the Leislerian Rebellion might seem far removed from the world of pirates. Yet the events of March 1691 were pivotal, for concealed behind the bare facts of the rebellion were the deep currents of political, social, and religious schism that would make New York a pirate haven for the next quarter century. Leisler and his followers have been termed proto-populists, a loose federation of lower-middle-class shopkeepers, tradesmen, sailors, and farmers. They identified themselves as ardent Protestants, Whigs, and fervent supporters of William of Orange. The men they chose as their political enemies were those who had profited most under Andros, wealthy merchants like Peter Schuller, William Smith, Nicholas Bayard, and Frederick Phillips. The execution of Leisler was a nuisance. Dead, he became a martyr for disenfranchised Whigs who felt betrayed by the failure of the crown to fulfill the promises of the glorious revolution.
getting all the moving pieces together for the explosion of piracy around about 1692 in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea is... Well, there are a lot of moving pieces, and the deeper into it I get, the more and more pieces I seem to find. However, we are getting there, and today we've got a relatively easy task in front of us. Instead of introducing an entirely new character from scratch, we get to talk about someone we know already. Today we're talking about Edward Davis, captain of the pirate ship Bachelor's Delight. This is episode 180. A Rash, Proud Coxcomb. We're going to begin today by returning to the very tail end of the Second Pacific Adventure. And really, at this point, it's not even accurate to call it a Pacific Adventure any longer. We're hardly spending any time in the Pacific Ocean at all. But I do want to remind you of the players here. You'll recall three main groups of pirates on that second adventure, based around their three primary pirate ships. There was the Signet, of course, under Captain Charles Swan. We've talked about that at length. There was the Saint Rose, under Francois Groinet at first, and later under Mathurin de Moray. And then there was Bachelor's Delight, under Edward Davis. Each of those ships had their own little fleets of sloops and barks that were under other captains. You have pirates like John Eaton and Francis Townley, George Dew, Peter Harris the Younger, Pierre Le Picard, William Knight. There are a ton of them, and we've met all of them before. Now, there are a few points about the Second Pacific Adventure that are going to be important today. First, the reason that that Second Adventure started at all. In 1683, King Charles II promulgated a decree against pirates and English privateers sailing for foreign princes. Then he reinstated Thomas Lynch as governor of Jamaica. At the time, Henry Morgan was acting governor, but the two together led an English campaign against piracy in the West Indies. Now, when King Charles promulgated that decree and it was read aloud in places like Port Royal, John Cook and Edward Davis were on the Mosquito Coast far enough from civilization that they could claim they had never heard anything about it. After all, they still had letters of Mark from the governor in Tortuga. Maybe they were a decade old, sure, and maybe from a long-concluded war, but they still had them. Rather than risk running into anybody who might be able to officially give them the news of the decree, they skipped town. They made for Virginia to pick up Dampier and then on to Africa to steal the Bachelor's Delight. Now this was a big deal. Bachelor's Delight, before being rechristened Bachelor's Delight, was a Dutch slaver. Its cargo, human beings intended for the slave markets, was really valuable, and in the mercantilist system that we discussed last time, stealing those human pieces of cargo was stealing directly from William III. And that's important to keep in mind here. We're going to be returning to the civilized world alongside these pirates, and that civilized world, including William III, had not forgotten that affront. The pirates in the newly christened Bachelor's Delight rounded Cape Horn and almost accidentally picked up that mosquito guide they had left on the Juan Fernandez Islands. They met up with a few other pirates, including the Signet, and then once they neared Panama they ran into that group of French pirates. Now that's an important moment. The leader of those French buccaneers, Francois Groinet, had a bunch of letters of mark, a bunch of brand new letters of mark from the governor in Saint-Domingue. Now Groinet was happy to hand those letters of mark out to his English brothers, but he only did so in return for the recently captured Spanish vessel, Santa Rosa. Now that alliance fell apart after an attempt on the Spanish treasure fleet. The fleets then split up into their three different parts. Dampier went with the Signet to cross the Pacific, and we know that story. Ravno de Luzon, a chronicler on this voyage, went with the French and an Englishman named George Du to cross the continent through Honduras to Cabo Gracias a Dios. Now we know that story too, even though it's not yet done. But the English pirates under Edward Davis, the Bachelor's Delight, we haven't told their story. 
640 pirates strong, they still had their brand new French letters of mark when they sailed south. Before they left the Pacific Ocean, the pirates stopped at the Juan Fernandez Islands one last time. Now, this was always a good place to stop to collect wood and water before rounding Cape Horn, which was always a hard bit of sailing. But a ton of pirates, a bunch of Englishmen who were sailing alongside the Bachelor's Delight, chose to stay at the Juan Fernandez Islands. And I'm fascinated by that move. I mean, why would they stop at an island that was occasionally patrolled by the Spanish so far away from home? But when you begin to dig into it, it does start to make a little bit of sense. First of all, they did have some women with them. Pirates in general, whenever they encountered groups of people on land, there were always young women who thought that running off with a dashing sea rover and living a life of freedom and romance and adventure sounded much better than a life of domestic bliss dictated by one or another of the patriarchs who controlled her life. And this happened with sailors of all walks of life, but it's not like the East India Company was just going to let you bring some girl on board because you're just super in love. And then, of course, a bunch of the pirates were gay. So most of the pirates who chose to stay there on the Juan Fernandez probably had some kind of companionship or a lover to stay with them. And in many cases, those lovers would see the pirates and their companion shunned by society. For those who were gay, of course there would be complications in the early modern world. But then, of course, for those even who had women with them, well, say that you returned to Port Royal with one of those rescued African women, and a few of those freed slaves did choose to stay with the pirates, well, what was going to happen to her? I mean, it's not like anyone here had had time to visit a church, but many of them had spent years with these companions by this point, formed real bonds. And when they get to Port Royal, some official is going to say, your wife, poppycock, balderdash, she can't be your wife, she's stolen property. But beyond that, many of the pirates were broke at this point. Sure, they'd earned a ton of money on their adventures, but some of them had lost all of it gambling. So doesn't a simple life on an island paradise with the lover of your choosing sound a lot better than destitution in some city while your wife is sold off to some rich old rapist slave owner. But most of all, beyond all of that, there was of course the question of arrest and execution. I mean, these pirates weren't dumb. They knew that their letters of marque from the French governor of Saint-Domingue weren't really worth the paper they were printed on. If they had a sea chest full of silver, maybe it was worth the risk of going back. But since these pirates didn't, why bother risking the gallows? And remember, the last that these pirates had heard of the English-speaking world, the king had just promulgated a decree that allowed for the extrajudicial killing of anyone even associated with the pirates, much less the pirates themselves. Given all of those variables... What would you choose to do? So it was a smaller force that sailed for Cape Horn. Now, we don't have the benefit of a record keeper like Revno de Luzon or William Dampier on this leg of the voyage. We don't know much about their passage. Was it maybe a fraught, near-run voyage, or maybe they found the edge of the world out there, or maybe they stumbled upon Never Never Land? And I'm not exactly joking there. Now, I don't want to get caught up in this today, but there are a lot of connections between Neverland and the Peter Pan story and this leg of this voyage. And actually, Australia is a big part of that as well. Never Never was a nickname in Victorian England for Australia. But here in December 1687, from the deck of his ship, Edward Davis did spy an island in the distance an island of coves and lagoons and sandy beaches, all of it topped by a forested mountain top, and much of it covered, in fact coated, in bright pink flamingos. Now, William Dampier would call this island Davis Land, and postulated in his book that it was part of Terra Australis Incognita, all of which was, of course, 
terribly miscalculated. Later on, in this same voyage, Dampier would in fact stumble upon proper Australia, although he didn't realize it at the time. Now, of course, there's no Davis land today, and that's something that J. M. Barry knew very well by about 1900. But of course, Never Never Land was in the imagination of all children, not just sitting out there in the Pacific Ocean. Now, I do want to talk more about this. It's interesting, but we're going to hold off on it today. Instead, for the time being, we're going to let Edward Davis and Bachelor's Delight make their way north on their own. In the meanwhile, we're going to turn our eyes back to Jamaica and her governors. All throughout this era, all of the years between, say, the Stuart Restoration and the Glorious Revolution, the colony of Jamaica had no proper governor. They had, you know, deputy governors and lieutenant governors and acting governors who did the job, but were never officially invested with royal authority. And all of that is thanks to the man who really should have been governor here, the Duke of Albemarle, Christopher Monk. And despite being only occasionally actually in Jamaica, Albemarle was, without a doubt, the most powerful man in Jamaica. Almost all of the acting governors and lieutenant governors, well, they were all in his pocket. Thomas Modiford and Thomas Lynch and Henry Morgan, all his. Now, at this point in our story, as 1687 turns into 1688, Albemarle was actually serving a brief stint as acting governor of Jamaica. All of his men were currently indisposed, either in jail or having fallen out of royal favor. I often turn to 1688 as kind of a focal point in our story, and the story of pirates and piracy, but it impacts so many things. I mean, just look at how it affected Jamaica here. Albemarle was acting governor at the time, but most of the real work was done by either Henry Morgan or one of his competitors named Hinder Molesworth. Now, Molesworth was a militia captain who was able enough, especially in military matters, but by no means a proper royal colonial administrator. But then, in May of 1688, Henry Morgan dies. A few months later, in August, the Duke of Albemarle himself Christopher Monk also died, so Jamaica was left in the hands of a man who was... Well, I don't want to completely disparage him. He would be awarded a baronet for his service here, but this was not the job for him. And of course, it being 1688, everyone knew that something, probably a war, was brewing on the horizon. But King James did have a plan here. He was going to appoint one of the most decorated and renowned naval commanders in all of England to lead Jamaica. This man, Robert Holmes is his name, Admiral Sir Robert Holmes, when the Royal Navy was established at the restoration of the Stuarts, he was one of the Navy's brightest stars. The man who was tasked with building the Royal Navy, Samuel Pepys, he saw a ton of promise in Robert Holmes. He also saw beneficial connections to King Charles. Pepys wrote, quote, He seems well acquainted with the king's mind, and with all the factions at court, and spoke with such frankness that I do take him as my lord's good friend, a cunning fellow, and one that can put on several faces and look his enemies in the face with as much love as his friends. End quote. Pepys also called Admiral Holmes a bit later on and less charitably, quote, a rash, proud coxcomb. A coxcomb was the name for a jester's hat, you know, with the bells dangling on several points. But in Pepys' day it was another word for a fop, or a man who was obsessed with his appearance and his social standing, you know, a peacock. Now, we could spend hours and episodes discussing Holmes' many naval victories and feats of valor in four major global naval wars. I mean, it's very likely that he would have been tapped as Lord High Admiral if it had not been for James, the king's brother, holding the post. Instead, after many years of good service, Holmes retired to spend his days managing his many and very profitable estates. 
But then when King Charles, his very good friend, remember, when Charles died, Holmes fell in with a bad crowd. The Monmouth rebels, supporting the illegitimate son of Charles II for the throne. No, he didn't openly join the rebellion, but he made it known that he thought Monmouth would make a perfectly fine king, and if he needed a mm, steady hand at the wheel, he would find a good friend in Robert Holmes, and someone who would serve as an excellent Lord High Admiral. Now, this wasn't quite enough to get someone like Holmes arrested, but it was plenty to get him assigned to a fleet intended to rid the West Indies of their pirate menace. It was a dirty job in a dirty backwater, and it was, in effect, an exile. Holmes was expected to stick around until the job of ridding the West Indies of piracy was done, and the pirates weren't going to leave any time soon. Now, you may have noticed that we've never talked about Robert Holmes before. For such a decorated man in such an important post, why not? Well, mostly because he never got to Port Royal. Holmes spent almost two years getting all of the apparatus in place to deal with the West Indian pirates. He had several full naval squadrons complete with their requisite commanders all in place and ready to go. They would stretch from the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia all the way down to Port Royal. It was an impressive achievement, even for someone as illustrious as Admiral Sir Robert Holmes. But then, then reports started filtering in that the Dutch appeared to be up to something. Troops were massing. Naval units were gathering, it looked like an invasion. Holmes was ordered to command the Channel Forces for that fight, so he never made it to Jamaica to take up any kind of command. His one-time subordinate, before Holmes retired, Rear Admiral Sir John Narborough, took the job. Now, Narborough was fully capable of doing that job. The book Pirates on the Chesapeake by Donald G. Chamette says, quote, the Admiral embarked with strong personal inducements to ensure his success. Not only was he granted all profits from his and his agents' seizure of privateer and pirate vessels, but his personal authority in matters relating to his mission was to supersede that of all English colonial governors. Assisted by Thomas Lynch, his zealously active deputy, and keeper of the King's Privy Seal and a corps of agents, Holmes pursued his objectives with the resolution of a school of piranha stripping a carcass. His ships cruised about the isolated coasts, inlets, and islets of the Americas frequented by pirates, making suddenly and occasionally indiscriminate descents on suspected vessels. Through his network of agents, Holmes waged a heavy-handed campaign of hectoring designed to dismantle the growing affiliations between governors and local councils, and the Buccaneering Brotherhood. End quote. Now there are a couple of pretty big inaccuracies in that passage. You might have caught them. For example, he says that Holmes was working in the West Indies when he was busy in Europe at the time. This is a trap I've seen several historians fall into, because Holmes was still technically in charge of the operation, but he was busy dealing with the Dutch invasion. The plan, once he put this little invasion force down, was for him to pick up the job that Sir John Narborough was currently doing. And then, of course, Chamette also says that Governor Lynch was involved, assisting Admiral Holmes. But of course, Governor Lynch was four years dead by 1688. However, his assessment of the ferocity and the tactics used in this assault is spot on. And that's bad news for a pirate crew so recently returned from a years-long voyage in the South Seas with holds that were figuratively bursting at the seams with Spanish booty. Our first word of Bachelor's Delight after leaving the Pacific comes in mid-1688. Edward Carter, captain of a privateer sloop out of Barbados, met the Delight off the coast of Brazil. Captain Carter informed Captain Davis and the rest of a major development for these privateers. On 22nd May 1687, just about a year earlier, 
Alongside his assignment of Admiral Holmes to Port Royal, James II promulgated yet another anti-piracy decree. Now this one built on that of 1683 with one major stipulation. While the extrajudicial killing of pirates was still allowed, pirates, or rather privateers, who surrendered to the authorities were to be granted pardons. And this was huge news for the pirates of Bachelor's Delight. Maybe they would now have the opportunity to go home. And sure, they might have to stop off along the way and bury a bit of treasure, but they could go home. Which is worth note, pirates did sometimes bury their treasure. Very occasionally, in the case of someone like Francis Drake or Henry Every, they did so because they just had way too much plunder to deal with, but usually it was to hide their plunder from the authorities, or, you know, just other rival pirates. Now, in most cases, the pirates would just go collect that treasure as soon as possible. It's those very few who didn't who were killed in action or executed after burying their treasure that make for the most famous stories of pirates hunting down buried treasure. But that wasn't going to be the case with Captain Davis or the Bachelor's Delight. Captain Carter also had news of John Narborough and his fleet of pirate hunters doing their very best to hunt down and capture any pirate they could before they had the opportunity to collect that pardon. Because, of course, when they did so, they got to keep the money. Now, what Captain Carter did not know at the time, and I do know, is that Narborough had basically abandoned his whole pirate hunting game by this point. It wasn't nearly as lucrative as he had hoped. The pardons did their job very quickly, and by the time he really got down to business, there just weren't that many pirates left to catch in the West Indies. Instead... Narborough decided to sail for the Silver Reef at the very southern end of the Bahamas, the resting place of La Nuestra Señora, a ship that he'd attempted to gather some treasure from several years back, only to be double-dealed by that scoundrel William Phipps. They pulled up a reasonable amount of silver, but John Narborough never managed to see a dime. At almost the exact same moment that Captains Davis and Carter were meeting up off the coast of Brazil, Rear Admiral Sir John Narborough caught a swift sickness and died at sea. 1688 But since Captain Carter didn't know any of this, he offered to escort Bachelor's Delight all the way north to Philadelphia. And that's where Davis and her crew arrived later that month. The North American colonies at this point were just the kind of corrupt and fertile and eminently lenient lands that a good pirate needed. The people of Philadelphia studiously failed to realize that this was Bachelor's Delight, the famed pirate ship. Dock records, though, prove that they did in fact know. They were more than happy to buy their illicit cargo at cut-rate prices and to accept Spanish doubloons and pieces of eight, for all of the goods and services that a pirate crew just returned to civilization might want. Beyond that, right at this moment, the English in the region had much bigger fish to fry. They were dealing with an impending war with France, they were dealing with revolution, both glorious and less so, and they had pirate problems of their own. And a privateer like Captain Davis was infamous for... What exactly? Raiding the Spanish? Good for him. And seizing a Dutch slave ship? Fine by me. I mean, it's not like William III, Prince of Orange, has any authority in the English world, after all. So, Captain Davis and the crew of Bachelor's Delight were just kind of free to do as they pleased. And this moment, the actions of Edward Davis and his crew in North America in 1688... It's one of those moments that's at the top of my list for things I would love to go back in time to see. Because something happened here in 1688, something big. A sea change in the pirate world was about to take place. In, you know, dimly lit dockside taverns and warehouses of the Atlantic coast, something was happening. And we don't know what it was. 
Because why would we? Plans were being laid for a global criminal enterprise involving a few very high-profile citizens. They weren't exactly going to put that in the broadsheets. But look at who was present at the time, in, yeah, in Philadelphia, but mainly in New York and Providence and Boston. Bachelor's Delight was there, with several famous pirates aboard. Edward Davis, yes, but he's about to walk off the stage. It also had pirates like George Rayner, who will become infamous in the very near future, and a few others, notably a pirate named Richard Wunt. But there were a host of other pirates in the region at the time. Now, I'm hesitant to name names here. We can't be sure about some of them. Thomas, too, was probably poking his nose around, but we can't be certain. See, right now, at this point in time, there was another, similar moment happening down in the West Indies. Now, we're going to get to that in two weeks' time. I don't want to dwell on it today. But a ton of pirate names that you know, pirates who famously originated from New England, were at this moment in Tortuga. But here in North America, there are a few pirates that we can reliably say were here. Edward Coates, for example, Samuel Burgess, probably, and a pirate that you very likely may have heard of named William May. More significant, though, I think, are three New Yorkers. Two of them we met last time. The German-born governor of New York, Jacob Leisler, and an extremely wealthy merchant named Frederick Philippes. The third name is less prominent in society, but he's one of the key figures in our story moving forward. Adam Baldrige. Remember that name. But you don't need to worry about any of that right now. We'll look in much greater depth at what may or may not have been happening here next time. For now, I want to stick with Edward Davis. After two Pacific adventures and after acquiring a heap of silver, it was time for Edward Davis to retire. Davis sold the Bachelor's Delight to his quartermaster, George Rayner, and he bought a shallop, a, a tiny little coastal skimmer, to leave his life of crime behind him. I just bought a book, a book that I really wish I had had just a few months back. It came out earlier this year, just about the time we started talking about some of those Chesapeake Bay pirates. Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay by Dr. Jamie L. H. Goodall. She's a historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History, specifically dealing in Atlantic maritime history and pirate history, and from her blog, it's pretty clear I owe her a debt. She's worked on digitizing all kinds of relevant pirate documents, and I've made much use of many of them. Regardless, Pirates of the Chesapeake is excellent, and you should check it out, and I'm going to read from it here. Dr. Goodall writes, quote, On a hot summer day back in June 1688, four men, Edward Davis, an enslaved black man named Peter Cloyce, Lionel de la Wafer and John Henson made their way down the Chesapeake in an unassuming shallop. The men were accompanied by a treasure trove of goods. Davis had three bags of Spanish pieces of eight, 142 pounds of broken silver, silk stockings, and expensive linens. Similarly, de la Wafer had three bags of Spanish currency, 37 silver plates, silver lace, 84 pounds of broken silver, and an assortment of dishes. Henson had an additional two bags of Spanish currency, including 800 pieces of eight, 106 pounds worth of broken silver, fine linens, and cloth. Together, all the goods were valued at over 2,300 pounds sterling. So, how did these men come to have such a wealth of belongings? End quote. Of course, we know exactly how they came by such a wealth of belongings around here. Now, I do want to point out that Lionel de la Wafer is Lionel Wafer. It was an alternate publication use of his name. But what's more interesting to me is how we know exactly how much each of them had. Well, Goodall answers that question as well. She writes, quote, one of Robert Holmes' agents, Captain Simon Rowe, witnessed a shallop making its way down the Chesapeake and was 
immediately suspicious when he saw it was carrying rather large chests. Ro ordered the shallop to stop and, upon further inspection, seized the men and their goods and immediately shipped them off to Jamestown under suspicion of piracy. End quote. Suspicion of piracy, indeed. Now, we have some records of their interrogations in Jamestown. They were done separately, and let me tell you, when the Jamestown authorities realized exactly who they had in their possession, they were thrilled. But we're going to leave that story for another day. Those men were going to waste away in that Jamestown jail for years, off and on. The proceedings and their fight for freedom and those interrogations, well, that's a story that's full of twists and turns. It involves the London publishing market and William Dampier and the Royal Society of London, and it even proves something of a test for William III and his promise to respect English law, even when that law came from his predecessor, even when it involved pirates who stole, not that long ago, a whole ship full of his Dutch slaves. I told you last time we were going to talk about the events in New England in 1688, Bachelor's Delight and King William's War, the New England privateers cooking up new plots. But as I parsed through that story, I realized it makes much more sense to wait. That story is important, but before we get there, we need to turn our eyes to the south, to events taking place in and around Tortuga and Petit Guave and saint Domingue in general that involve the last great generation of French and Dutch buccaneers. Now, I'm going to be asking a lot of you today. There are a number of stories we've talked about in the past that are all coming together right here. I'm going to be referencing all of them, which makes today both a terrible place to pick up the show, but also an excellent place, because all of those threads are going to begin to coalesce today. I want to pick up today, again, at the tail end of the Second Pacific Adventure. This time, though, with the French fleet that was led originally by Francois Groenet. By the 1st of January, 1688, Groenet was dead, and his fleet had been split into two factions. The French marched under Mathurin de Moray. The English, at that point, were under George Dew. And I say they marched because by the 1st of January, 1688, the pirates had abandoned their ships and landed on the coast of Honduras to begin their march overland to return to the North Sea. You may recall that story through the eyes of Ravno de Lusan. If so, you probably remember the animosity between the two sides, the English and the French. For example, Lusan makes special note of Pierre Le Picard, perhaps the same Picard that sailed under Henry Morgan, but on this voyage he marched with the English, not the French. But beyond just pure animosity, they were playing politics as well. All of these pirates were heading home, and there were rumors that England and France might soon be at war. It, it looked bad to march home under the banner of the enemy, but... Everyone in Port Royal or Petit Guave could understand and even forgive a tense alliance against the hated Spanish. Now that march is the story that I compared to an old western. Recall the pitched battle at an old Spanish church and the beautiful mestizo women carried off by our black hat-wearing, mustache-twirling villains. After the running cavalry battle through the mountains of Central America, the pirates finally escaped and built what they called piperies. Those are those standing rafts that they built and rowed down river. I want to remind you here of the English pirates that were found dead along the river, later discovered to have been killed by French buccaneers. Buccaneers who killed them stole their treasure and ran away into the wilderness. To say that that raised tensions between the two factions is an understatement. 
But eventually, these two separate groups, who were very nearly at blows with one another, reached Cabo Gracias a Dios, at the very northern tip of the Mosquito Coast. Now that's the home of the largest settlement of Mosquito people anywhere in the world. It's also the spot that Francois Lolonet lost his life, where he was ritualistically eaten by the Mosquito that he had spent several weeks abusing and torturing. That was the last substantial interaction that any French pirates had with the Mosquito people, so these French pirates were a bit tense. But the presence of the English likely tempered whatever animosity may have been present toward them. Now, Luson was understandably nervous, but he grew even more so when the English pirates spotted a merchantman out of Port Royal and flagged her down. Luson writes, quote, The English met with an English boat from Jamaica, whom they were very forward to press to go and ask leave of the governor of that island for their safe coming thither, because they had gone without any commission. That vessel was unwilling to go thither without they laid down six thousand pounds sterling by way of advance. They, the pirates, being not in a condition to run the hazard of such a sum, because many had lost their money by the oversetting of their piperies, stayed with the Mosquito Indians, who are very kind to them. End quote. So the pirates all just kind of settled down to wait. The English were living among the Mosquito, and the French were living alone just down the coast. There was a tense moment here when a party of Mosquito men arrived at the French camp, but there were some Englishmen that followed them shortly. Lusanne says they, quote, politically thought to send us word. See, there was another ship nearby. The Mosquito had spotted her, and the English were happy to lead the French to it and sail away, but the French had to agree to take the English with them to Saint-Domingue. The captain of that ship offered to drop all of the pirates, or even just the English, at Jamaica. But Lusanne says, quote, We, not knowing how matters stood between France and England, whether it were peace or war, engaged him to carry us to Santo Domingo for forty pieces of eight a head. End quote. And it's here, with their arrival at Saint Domingue, that Ravno de Luson's story comes to an end. And that's a real shame, because when they arrived at Saint Domingue, big things started to happen. Decisions were being made that were going to shape the world of the pirates for years to come. If one were inclined to give events such as this, about which very little is actually known, if one were inclined to give them big, dramatic, hyperbolic names, one might choose to call an event like this the Last Council of the Brethren of the Coast. Of course, to use such a hyperbolic name, one would have to be kind of a fool. This is episode 181, The Last Council of the Brethren of the Coast. As this is the swan song of the Tortuga Buccaneers, I think it's fitting to take a moment to remember the island's pirate history. This will also let us put the relevant players in place for the events of the Last Council of the Brethren of the Coast. The French colony on Hispaniola was founded by Huguenot Bucanyi around about 1625. From their base on the island of Tortuga, they hunted a boar, but by 1650 or so, they had graduated to hunting Spanish shipping. It was in 1665 that King Louis XIV finally officially recognized the colony and exerted some oversight. The governor that he installed there, Bertrand de Algron, was little more than a buccaneer himself. He was fully in support of the Brethren of the Coast, a coalition of buccaneers from Tortuga and Port Royal, led most famously by Henry Morgan. As the Franco-Dutch war loomed on the horizon, de Augran founded a new capital at Petit Guave, on the northern coast of that long peninsula in southwest Hispaniola. It was de Augran's nephew, though, his successor, Jacques Napevu, that prosecuted the war. He did so by Lettres de Marque, Letters of Mark, and he empowered an entirely new generation of Brethren of the Coast to do so. 
The leader of this generation of brethren was Michel de Grammont, the king of the buccaneers of the 1670s, and Grammont was French. But his protégés, men like Michael André Zun and Laro de Graaf, Jan Willems, and Jacob Evertsen, they were all Dutch. However, most of their lieutenants and quartermasters were French. People like Pierre Le Pen, Jean Fantin, Jean-Baptiste Ducasse, and Jean Charpin. Now, I know that I'm throwing a lot of names at you, names that you likely have forgotten by this point, but they're going to come into play today. There was also, though, the odd Englishman in this ragtag group of pirates, people like Thomas Paine. Now, in the latter years of the Franco-Dutch War, and the years immediately following the war, this cabal of privateers was at the top of their game. They, they could attack the Spanish anywhere, on land or at sea, and do so nearly with impunity. But then, in 1683, the English Declaration Against Piracy was promulgated. Most of the English pirates in the West Indies sailed south for the Second Pacific Adventure, and a lion's share of the Frenchmen went with them. That's Mathurin de Moray and Francois Groenet. But there were those, like Lauro de Groff, that settled down and planted sugar. This shift away from a privateering-based economy toward an economy based on agriculture and slavery, well, that was the real tipping point for Saint-Domingue. That's when the island's character began to change. The few pirates who stuck around at Saint-Domingue who didn't sail south, but also weren't of a mind to settle down and buy slaves and start growing sugar, well, they found Tortuga, even, less and less welcoming. So those pirates left Saint-Domingue behind. They roved the seas, which gives rise to that piratical reign of terror that lasted from 1683 to about 1685. It was during that period that pirates like Jan Willems and Thomas Paine and Jean Fantin and Jacob Everts and that whole group, that's when they would descend on ships and cities and devour their plunder like locusts. But that state of affairs could not last. The hammer was going to come down. The, the sword of Damocles was hanging over their heads, and it became clear that they had nowhere left to hide in the West Indies. So most of them fled. Several went to Africa, but some of them, like Thomas Paine and Jan Willems, they headed north, for Newport, Rhode Island in their case. Remember, Thomas Paine built that famous windmill. But this exodus gave the West Indies a couple of years of relative quiet. And then... 1688 arrived. In January, just after those Pacific adventurers had landed on the mainland, the Duke of Albemarle, serving as governor of Jamaica, received word, quote, The pirates, Yankee and Jacobs, Jan Willems and Jacob Evertson, have fallen upon a great Spanish ship in the Bay of Honduras called the Hulk, or the Urca. If Yankee failed in this attempt, he is ruined for it is said that he was very ill-provided before. End quote. Jan Willems was ill-provided before. It was a lean couple of years, but that raid was a success. And it's going to prove to become a major turning point in today's story. But it was also the last adventure of either Jan Willems or Jacob Evertsen. They were both killed in action during the fight. But after the death of those two captains, their fleet split up. Now, we don't know the details here, but boy, do I wish we did. See, there was a schism between two factions in that fleet, and it appears to have been mostly a schism along national lines. And each side chose their own respective leader, lieutenants of Jan Willems and Jacob Evertsen. The English chose George Peterson, and the French, Jean Fantin. Now, this split may have been peaceful, amicable, even. Or maybe not. What we do know is that George Peterson, if there was any fighting, appears to have won, because he took their ship north to New England. You may remember this story. He sold off a ton of plunder in Boston, a suspicious amount of plunder. 
so much that the Sally Rose and her captain, Thomas Pound, was sent to chase him off. But the other half of that fleet we haven't discussed very much, the French half, led by Jean Fantin. They were marooned after the battle to take the Urca, on an island called Roatan, off the north coast of Honduras. And I know that sounds pretty terrible. There was probably some fighting, right? I mean, who maroons their crewmen? But there may have been a deal struck here. Now, that crew was small, but there were a few British pirates, seven or eight of them, that chose not to sail with George Peterson. One of those pirates may or may not be one of the most famous pirates of all time. This episode may or may not exist mostly to introduce one of these most famous pirates of all time. But before that, if you'll forgive me just a bit of speculation here, there's a series of events that could have happened. The timeline makes sense, and it does explain some questions to me at least. But it's a... It's a story we don't have any evidence for. If you were an English pirate sailing away from Roatan Island, there are only two directions you can go. You could sail north, but that would take you directly into the Spanish-Cuban waters. Or you could sail east along the coast of Honduras, which would take you right by Cabo Gracias a Dios. That's where the modern borders of Honduras and Nicaragua meet, and it's where the Mosquito Coast begins. George Peterson, an English pirate, would almost certainly have stopped off there. He would have wanted to collect wood and water and probably food. And as an Englishman, he knew the Mosquito people. Now this is the sort of routine thing that was happening all the time in the West Indies. But this, shortly after the sack of that Urca, was in late January 1688. Which is naturally exactly the moment when all of those pirates from the Second Pacific Adventure were at Cabo Gracias a Dios, living among the Mosquito and looking for a ride to Santo Domingo. Now, Ravno de Luzon, in his chronicle, never mentions George Peterson by name, but it's possible he may not even have known who George Peterson was. No, I'm not saying it was George Peterson. History is rarely, if ever, that friendly to a storyteller. But it does kind of make sense, doesn't it? He was in the region at the time. And who else do you imagine would stop off at the Mosquito Coast at a settlement of Mosquito Indians and offer to give a bunch of rambunctious, filthy pirates fresh out of the Pacific Ocean a ride home? Some God-fearing merchant trader on his way back to Port Royal, a good king's man would stop and give a bunch of French buccaneers a ride to Santo Domingo? No. A smuggler, maybe, but another pirate seems the most likely, and George Peterson was there at the time. So keep that in mind. Because it would, if it did happen to be the case, it would explain one of the most confusing elements of today's story. Regardless of who the captain happened to be, it was early February when the pirates from the Second Pacific Adventure arrived off the coast of Hispaniola. They anchored at Cow Island, the Isle of Ake, one of the favorite clandestine meeting spots of the Brethren of the Coast. The fleet sent a group to Petit Guave to announce their return to the West Indies, to those in the right circles at least, but also to learn what they could about the political situation. And this sets the gears for the last council of the Brethren of the Coast to turning. So what actually happened at the last council of the Brethren of the Coast? Well, by this point, Lauro de Graff was a respectable citizen. He had a plantation up at the recently founded Cap Francais. And then word arrived that a bunch of his old friends and comrades had arrived at Isla Vache, so de Graff sailed south to meet with them. The governor, at this point Pierre-Paul de Cousset, was going to show up as well, but not yet. He gave Lauro de Graff enough time to put everything in its right place, to make sure that these pirates didn't look too much like pirates, to ensure, that is, that they would not be immediately arrested and subsequently executed. De Graff organized everything. 
He sent a bunch of pirates off on a mission, first of all, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the rest he folded into his little privateer army, something that the governor, with a war on the horizon, certainly could not have objected to. All of this, the council in general, reminds me of like a high school kid who threw a real rager of a party while his parents were away for the weekend, and then... Sunday evening, was desperately trying to clean up all of the liquor bottles and that spot where the bong water spilled before his parents get home. But while this is going on, while the Graf is trying to put everything in place, before the parents, Governor de say, get home, I want to look at the actions of one single pirate. A pirate who has been with us since almost the very beginning. Pierre Le Picard. David F. Marley writes in Pirates of the Americas, Picard and his flibustier were leery of any official retaliation for their actions, peace having long since been declared. Therefore, they feigned ignorance of this state of affairs. Governor de Cusset was not present, being on an inspection tour of Saint-Domingue's northern districts, so there were no immediate repercussions. Although it soon became obvious that crown policy had changed drastically with regard to roving. Picard and many other freebooters therefore elected to disperse farther afield. End quote. Picard would settle down eventually in French Acadia, up in modern Canada. But first he made a brief stop at Newport, Rhode Island. And this visit matches up almost perfectly with George Peterson's arrival at Newport, Rhode Island. If one were working off the assumption that it was, in fact, George Peterson who picked those pirates up at Cabo Gracias a Dios, it's possible, even likely, that it was George Peterson that gave Pierre Le Picard a ride up to Rhode Island. Now, no one thought much about Picard's arrival at the time, But a couple of weeks later, when some of Peterson's men were arrested for fencing all of that plunder, everyone started to look really hard at old Pierre Le Picard. He was followed, maybe even picked up and questioned. But nothing came of it. He was behaving himself and didn't have a suspicious amount of treasure on him. But I do want to mention another man who was in Newport at the time. Not yet a pirate, not even a sailor, as far as we know. Thomas, too, owned a small farm just outside of Newport, Rhode Island. He had a wife and two children in Newport in 1688. And in fact, it's that little tidbit that gives us our first reputable record we have of Thomas, too. We don't even know where Tu was born, maybe England or maybe America. There are those who believe Bermuda is the most likely possibility. There are, of course, rumors and legends about all of it, but nothing's concrete here. Now, it's not Thomas II that is the one of the most famous pirates of all time toward which we are working today. He just happened to be in Rhode Island at the time that George Peterson and Pierre Le Picard met up with Thomas Paine. If he had any contact with the pirates at all, which is possible, but we don't know, but if he did, it's likely no more than him having bought them some drinks and listened to their stories at the local tavern. But with that we can finally say goodbye to one of the original Brethren of the Coast and wish Pierre Le Picard a long and restful retirement. But when we turn our eyes back to the West Indies and the last council of the Brethren of the Coast, we finally have some hard documents from which to work. Thanks to Pierre Paul de Cousset, the governor who was about to arrive at the council. That story begins three or four months earlier, in late 1687, when Lauro de Graff was attacked by a Spanish frigate for, you know, the piracy. Now, that frigate, the Santa Rosa, which would be rechristened the Saint Rose when Lauro de Graff inevitably captured her, should not be confused with the Santa Rosa captured originally by Edward Davis in the Pacific. The pirates left that ship off the Pacific coast of Honduras before they went ashore. This Santa Rosa, though, the capture of this frigate, caused a minor scandal in Saint-Domingue. Spain and France were, as we said, at peace, 
and de Graff was actually forced to go before the governor and a colonial council to defend himself. In the end, though, Laro de Graff was permitted to keep the Saint Rose, largely because, well, it was a good ship and war was looming. When Laro de Graff sailed for Ilavache after the arrival of the Pacific adventurers, he took the Saint Rose with him. See, it was a, a big, new, well-armed frigate, but there just weren't enough pirates in Saint-Domingue to properly crew her. Until, that is, the second Pacific adventurers returned. All of a sudden, there were hundreds of experienced pirates who would know just what to do with a frigate like that. But then Governor de Cusay arrived at this council. The parents had come home. But de Cusay was kind of a you know, a cool, understanding kind of dad. He looked at DeGroff with an expression that said, Look, I know what you've been up to, but play your cards right and assure me that you didn't get up to anything too crazy and I won't mention it to your mom. Mostly, he was concerned that the Son Rose, that big, bright, shiny, well-armed new frigate, was nowhere in sight. That's the cool dad looking at DeGraff and saying, Look, I got up some pretty crazy stuff when I was your age, but just tell me you didn't give that ship to some dirty pirate, right? DeGraff, though, did play his cards right. He explained that he'd given command of the frigate over to one of his top men, Jean Charpin, who was an honorable privateer, someone that had not sailed down to the Pacific with all of those dirty pirates, and a privateer that the governor knew quite well. And where exactly was Jean Charpin and this bright, shiny, well-armed frigate? Well, de Graff explained that he had sent them on a very important and timely mission to pick up some very important men. But the crew of Saint Rose sent on this very important mission was almost entirely made up of filthy pirates from the Second Pacific Adventure. Now this is that difficult-to-explain moment I mentioned earlier. De Graff sent the Saint Rose to go pick up the pirates under Jean Fantin, who were at Roatan Island. And what I don't understand is how de Graff even knew that those pirates were there in the first place. But if George Peterson did, in fact, stop off at Cabo Gracias a Dios, pick up the Pacific Buccaneers, take them to Cow Island, and then sail on with Pierre Le Picard in tow to North America, he would certainly at some point have mentioned, oh, by the way, I left a bunch of French pirates at Roatan Island. You might want to go get those guys, especially if it was a relatively amicable separation. You know, they split the treasure 50-50 or whatever their proper shares were, but those pirates didn't want to go with Peterson, and Peterson didn't want them going with them. So we left them at a large, well-watered, well-populated with fish and fowl island, and said he'd tell somebody as soon as he ran into somebody trustworthy where they were. Now the Saint Rose is worth a really extra special note for two big reasons. First, the Articles of Agreement, the pirate code agreed to by the crew, survived. Now, I was going to read the code in full to you, but really it's mostly articles that we've seen before. As the last council of the Brethren of the Coast, the pirate code agreed to here at Ilavache looks very much like the pirate codes of Henry Morgan and the other Brethren of the Coast. Shares are divvied up equally, except for those that go to the captain and the quartermaster and the surgeons. There are allotments made for injury payments, that sort of thing, Nothing we haven't seen before. There are a few interesting points, though. For example, quote, Item, every man convicted of cowardice will lose his share. Or, quote, Any man making false oath and convicted of theft will lose his share and will be marooned on the first key. There's a lot of that, but what I really want to point to here, the most interesting part of this agreement, is the end. The articles finally conclude, quote, Done at Cow Island, Isle Lavache, anchored and founded on the 18th of February, 1688. Signed, Jean Cherpin and Mathurin de Marais. 
quartermaster of the crew. End quote. Mathur and Des Marais, so recently returned from the Pacific Ocean, was quartermaster. This was his crew. Odd that it was yet another Saint Rose, but as far as I can tell, just coincidence. So they picked up Jean Fantin and his crew at Roatan Island and returned all of them to Isle Vache. When they returned, the governor was still there. And he... Well, he was a little shocked at exactly how many pirates were aboard, but still pleased with their strength in numbers. Their numbers, if they could capture a few more ships, boded quite well for Saint-Domingue in the war to come. But Governor de Cusset should not have been so confident. Even though he didn't know it at the time, he even mentions the reason he should not have been so confident. In his journal, Governor Pierre-Paul Tarend de Cusset noted the presence of seven or eight Englishmen and the crew that were brought back from Roatan Island. And that serves as the first, the very first, reputable official mention of the pirate we have been getting to. Governor de Cusset named two Englishmen, Robert Culliford and another English pirate named William Kidd. Of course, William Kidd was actually Scottish, but the French governor didn't make that distinction. Captain Kidd, as he will go on to be known, is one of the most famous pirates of all time. Robert C. Ritchie, in his book Captain Kidd in the War Against the Pirates, places Kidd in a kind of pirate triumvirate, including Henry Morgan and Blackbeard. And in fact, it's a distinction that may or may not be earned in the case of William Kidd, as we're going to discuss in great detail. I would argue that the other pirates there on board the Saint Rose with Kidd, Robert Culliford in particular, were perhaps better pirates. Historian Richard Zacks writes in the introduction to his book, The Pirate Hunter, The True Story of Captain Kidd, quote, As I followed Kidd, another character kept elbowing his way upon the stage, Kidd's long-forgotten nemesis, Robert Culliford. It is uncanny how the lives of these two men intertwined and how they became locked in a kind of unscripted duel across the oceans of the world. End quote. Culliford is going to concern us a great deal in the weeks to come. Now, I'd love to give both Culliford and Kidd the kind of introduction I gave Henry Every. I'd like to give Thomas, too, that same introduction, but less is known about those three. Now, legend holds that Captain Kidd was born in Greenock, Scotland, circa 1645, to a Presbyterian minister, but there's no record of any of that. Not in any church records anywhere in Scotland, but Kidd was Scottish. Testimonies and testimonials from his crewmates and his jailers all make mention of his Scottish heritage. Now, he immigrated to America by at least 1687, but that's all we know about William Kidd before this mention on board the Saint Rose in 1688. Now, William Kidd is not yet famous. In fact, it's a surprise that the governor had made mention of him at all, but I'm glad he did. However, for the time being, this last council of the Brethren of the Coast had to be concluded. Mostly, the council was the governor and La de Graff and all of these French privateers divvying out letters of mark and preparing for the war, the war that everyone knew was on the horizon somewhere. They were preparing for the next era of buccaneering. They were all going to become rich men. However, thanks in large part to William Kidd himself, those plans weren't going to go as they thought. The Saint Rose was not going to be in control of the Saint Domingue privateers for much longer, and this was not going to be a great new era of privateering this was going to be the dawn of the golden age of piracy. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. 
Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, everybody who has left us ratings or reviews wherever it is you listen to the show, and everybody who has suggested this show to your friends or family, you all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.